may our hearts hunger that way. Thank you, ladies, for that great song. You know, when I think about the words of Jesus throughout the New Testament, there are a couple of particular claims that he made that always get the attention of not just the church, of course, but people outside the church and very, very controversial statements. One of them being that he claimed to be God and the other one being that he claimed to be the only way to heaven, to God. And we're going to talk about that second one today, talking about Jesus being the only way. From John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. This is a very, very important, a very important teaching in the life of the church. And when we think about world religions and other philosophies of religious belief out there, this is a very controversial statement of the Lord. But beginning in John 14, at verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and this is the statement, no one comes to the Father except through me. Back in 1975, a television game show premiered on ABC that ran for just two seasons. It was kind of an off-the-wall show, but for this 11-year-old boy, I thought it was pretty entertaining. It was a show called Almost Anything Goes. And I was looking at one website this week concerning this show, and, and one writer said that this show almost defies description. It was a game show filled with wild and loony activities. There were three teams that were pitted against one another, and they would perform all kinds of, of wild events. There would be some crazy obstacle courses, uh, some bizarre relay races. In one event, the contestants would dress up in the gorilla outfit and perform all kinds of feats of daring do in an effort to garner the most points and, and win the most cash and prizes. And it was called Almost Anything Goes. Am I the only one here that remembers that show? <laughs> A couple of you are afraid to raise your hand. I know how that goes. But that phrase, almost anything goes, could be used to describe the religious and spiritual climate here in the United States. Because there are many people who will say that when it comes to religion, when it comes to spiritual belief, almost anything goes. That it really doesn't matter exactly what you believe, as long as you believe it, with all your heart. As long as you're sincere in your efforts and spirituality, it doesn't matter which religion, which philosophy, which spiritual path you take, as long as you believe it and follow it and give your heart to it, why almost anything goes. It's very characteristic of the pluralism that we see here in the United States and in many parts of the world. Pluralism indicating, of course, the various religious beliefs that are held here in America but another definition of pluralism is this, that two or more religions are equally valid even if their belief systems are mutually exclusive. Now think about that. There's a philosophy that says that two or more religions, or that all religions, are equally valid even if there are points in their belief system that are mutually exclusive. Almost anything goes. Now when Jesus was here upon this earth teaching us, he said many things that cut across the grain of human nature. For example, he said the last shall be first. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. He said, to pray for and to love your enemies. 
But by far, the most outrageous thing that he said, and that which causes perhaps the most controversy, is when he indicated that he alone was the path to God, that he alone was the way to heaven. And this particular statement rankles a lot of people. And they accuse Jesus of being arrogant, narrow-minded, bigoted, snobbish. And yet Jesus was simply speaking the truth. He was just speaking the truth. So why, if this is the truth, why is it so controversial for us to say that Jesus is the only way. I thought Lee Strobel had some interesting things to say about this in an article I read. He said that one of the reasons why this really is so controversial and upsetting to so many people is that it, it cuts to the core of several myths that people believe about religion. And he named several myths. He said one myth is that when you really get right down to it, all religions are basically the same. Now that's a myth. It's a myth. He says that when you really get down to it, a lot of people say that all religions are the same. They all teach us to care about one another. They all teach us to, to do good things. They all teach us to improve our morality and our ethics. They all try to help us to better ourselves so that we're fit for heaven. And they say that all religions are basically the same. And so when Jesus comes along and says that no one comes to the Father except through Him, that sets Christianity apart from all the others and says no, all religions are not the same. And so one reason why this is such a controversial statement is that it cuts into the core of that myth that says all religions are basically the same. A second myth he indicated is this, that even if we say Christianity is different from other religions, it's still only one option among many. Now again, that's a myth, that Christianity is just one option among many. But to people out there in the world who believe that any religion is okay, if Jesus says, I am the only way, then you can see how unsettling that would be for people who say that any religion is fine. But of course, that's not what the Bible teaches, and that's certainly not what Christ taught. And then another myth that people hold is that Christians, when they say Jesus is the only way, are being narrow-minded, that we're being arrogant, in our position. Now I'm not going to address that now, but I am going to address it in a few moments when I get into the main body of my message. People saying that we're arrogant and narrow-minded when we say Jesus is the only way. When our family lived in Arkansas a number of years ago, we made numerous trips over to uh, Hot Springs because we weren't that far away, about 40 minutes. And I remember one time, our kids were little, like five, two, and one, something like that. And uh, she had some friends come from Texas, and they had, they had six kids. And they were all, you know, under 10, whatever. And you should have seen us crossing the street. You know, we had four, four of us adults and nine little kids. They looked like little ducklings, you know, <laughs> crossing the street in Hot Springs. I'll never forget that image in my head. But while we were there, we saw this car. And it was an older car, and the three people getting into it looked like they'd been zapped here right out of the 1960s. You know, all the psychedelic stuff. They looked like they were just the poster child for a new age thinking, you know. And the, the, the bumper sticker on the car said, God is too big to fit into one religion. God is too big to fit into one religion. Now, that sounds nice, doesn't it? That sounds good, maybe even inviting to a lot of people. But you see, the problem with that is it's only looking at God from a human perspective. It's taking our reasoning and applying it to this infinite being. And certainly does not take into account what the Bible says, what Jesus taught, and what the scriptures bring out. And so I want to share with you this morning three reasons why what Jesus said is to be embraced, certainly by the church, but is truth for all time and eternity. Right, three things. Number one, there is the matter of ultimate truth that must be considered. In some ways, 
You understand where I'm coming here? I'm just coming from here. I'm just it's just a hypothetical thing. In some ways, it would be nice if all roads led to heaven. In some ways, because that would mean there are fewer people lost, more people going to heaven, and fewer people going to hell. If any religion would do. But here's the issue. There's the matter of ultimate truth. It's simply not true that any old way will do. And you have to look at truth. We can't just want, make, make spiritual truth out to what we want it to be or what we wish it could be so that so-and-so can go to heaven. There's a matter of truth, an error, that must be dealt with. And God has revealed his truth to us in his word. And so whatever the Bible says is what we must cling to and hold to. In Acts 4 and verse 12, Peter said, Neither is there salvation in any other. Talking about Jesus, of course. He said, For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now notice what he said. He says that there is no other name under heaven given whereby we can be saved. You see, it's not as though God gave us a smorgasbord of religions to choose from as if you're going through a cafeteria line and say, well, I'll take that one. I don't want that one. Or maybe I could maybe mix a few religions together and get the best of this one and that one and come up with my own plate. You see, God didn't do that. Peter said there is no other name no other name under heaven except for Jesus. And so we can't follow the ways of Muhammad and we can't follow the ways of Joseph Smith or any other religious leader and expect to get to heaven. Because Peter says, inspired by the Holy Spirit as he was, that there is no other name. That is the truth. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus declared. And as God in the flesh, Jesus is right. Because he's God speaking to us, not just as his representative, but as God himself. Let's suppose you were trying to teach a child a mathematics. And you're sitting down with a, a young person and you're, you're writing out, let's say, three times three. And you tell them that it equals nine. And let's suppose as you teach this child, uh, he looks at you and, and says, uh, no, three times three is eight. And you say, no, it, it's not three times. And you explain how, how it's so. If you take three and you double it, you have six. If you add three more to it, that's three, three times, that's nine. And they say, well, maybe it's nine for you, but it's eight for me. Now, what would you say to that child? Would you say, well, whatever floats your boat? No. Because there's truth and there's error. Three times three is just a fact. Three times three has always been nine. It is nine today. And it will forever be nine. That will never change. It's just the law of mathematics. It's just how it works. Well, there are spiritual truths. <coughs> That God has handed down to us through his son, Jesus Christ, that cannot be altered. And that's just the way it is. That Jesus is the son of God and that he taught us that he is the only way. And I want to explain why as this message goes along. Now, as far as the accusation of Christians being narrow-minded and bigoted by saying Jesus is the only way. Let me, let me say this. And this is one other thing that Lee Strobel said I thought was very smart. He said, now, if... Any religion got you to heaven. If that were the case, that you could follow any religion and you could get to heaven, then if Christians said Jesus is the only way and our way is the best, that would be narrow-minded. That would be bigoted. That, that would be snobbish. But that's not what we're saying. We're not saying that all roads lead to heaven. And so really when we say that Jesus is the only way, we're being compassionate. Because we want people to go to heaven. And we're not saying that because, well, we think it's the best and we don't care about anybody else. It's because we want people to get... I mean, if you were trapped somewhere and there was only one way out of a cave or, or maybe out of a disastrous situation, a burning building, you're not saying this is the only way out because you're being arrogant. You're saying it's the only way out because you want people to live. It's compassionate. 
It's not arrogant. I suppose somebody has a baby, and this little child has jaundice. It's a fairly common thing. It's a disease of the liver that causes a child's skin to turn yellow and the whites of their eyes to be yellowish. And let's suppose the doctor says to the parents, because it's a very treatable situation, that we can treat the child by putting this child under a special light, and what it does is that it stimulates the liver and gets it to function properly, and your child should be doing very well within a short time. But what if those parents said, nah, we don't like that, too easy. We'd rather take this child and give it a good bath, you know, wash him real well, maybe bleach him, you know, uh, scrub him, and see if that takes care of the yellowish tint. And the doctor says, I'm sorry, but I, I'm an MD. I've been practicing medicine for 30, 40 years. And I happen to know this is the only way, the only way that we can treat your child and get your child healthy. Now, if you take your child home and do what you're talking about, most likely your child will die. Now, listen, if that parent, those parents say, okay, doctor, we're going to follow your advice. Would anyone say that they're being narrow-minded? <coughs> Would anyone accuse the doctor of being narrow-minded because he says this is the only way your child can be healed? No one would say that. No one would say he's being arrogant because this is the only way this child can get well. And so if anybody says Christians are being arrogant, narrow-minded, snobbish because we say Jesus is the only way, far from it. We're being compassionate because we're showing them the only way out of this burning inferno. And we want them to come, that they might know Jesus, because it's just the truth. It's what Jesus said, and Jesus always said <laughs> truth. Now, a second thing to consider, as far as Jesus being the only way, is that there is this matter of sin. There is the matter of sin that has to be dealt with. And this is what a lot of people miss when they talk about Jesus being the only way. It's not just that Jesus said it, although certainly that's enough, but there's also this matter of sin that has to be dealt with. No world religion deals with this issue. Other religions teach you to become good enough, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, to make yourself presentable to God, make yourself a better person, follow these <laughs> rules. They all deal with that, but none of them deal with your sin. You can reach a state of nirvana, as is taught in Buddhism, but you're still a sinner. You can chant mantras like they do in Hinduism, but afterwards you're still a sinner. You can bow five times a day, faithfully facing Mecca, as the Muslims do, but when you come up, you're still a sinner. You see, Christianity is the only religion that deals with that which has separated us from God, and that's our sin. And it has to be dealt with. There was a conference taking place in India a number of years ago with a lot of different leaders from various world religions, and there were some Christian missionaries that were also present at this place. And at one point during a break, they were talking, and one of these other world, re world religious leaders asked these Christians, they said, what can your religion offer my people of India that our religion doesn't? And he kind of said it like real challenge, like there was nothing. But these Christian missionaries said, forgiveness. Forgiveness. No other religion offers forgiveness. It's like if you make yourself good enough, if you do the right things and become better. But nothing deals with sin. A Bible teacher named David Paulson said that he's talked to countless Muslims over the years in his ministry. And he said, these, these people, they, they pray faithfully five times a day. They've made the pilgrimage to Mecca. They fast during Ramadan. He said some of these Muslims are more devout than some Christians he knows. And he says, but I ask them, do you know for certain that your sins are forgiven? And every time they say, we don't. 
We only have to hope for the best. Isn't that sad? Isn't that tragic? And this is one of the fastest, maybe the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. And these people don't even know if their sins are forgiven. You see, this, there's the matter of sin it has to be dealt with. In Isaiah 59 and verse 2, the Bible says that our sins have separated us from God. And the only way to be reconciled to God is through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 says that we've been reconciled to God through Jesus. So there's the matter of sin. One other piece that we have to consider is the matter of the cross. The matter of the cross that has to be dealt with. No other religion has Jesus on the cross and then resurrected. No other religion. Um, and, and especially looking at it as in terms of salvation, that our price was paid there for our sin. Why don't we ask, I want to ask you something. I want you to really think about this. If any old way would do, I mean, if any religion would work, and you could get there by following any world system of belief you wanted to, why? Why in the world would God have sent his son to die on that cross 2,000 years ago? Why? Why would he do it? If it didn't matter, if you could get there following any other path, if God says in heaven, well, they can get to heaven by following Islam or Hinduism or Taoism or whatever, then I'm not going to send Jesus. Why would you put your son through that? That suffering that he endured here on this earth that is unthinkable when you really study it. Imagine that a man went through what he went through. You see, it's, it's kind of like these other world religions are saying to God, you know, God, that was really something you did. Really nice. What you did sending your son to suffer as he did, to die on the cross. But you know, God, it really wasn't necessary. You really didn't have to do it. I want to put Mark 8.31 up here on the screen, Pastor John. Thank you. Look at this verse. It says that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of God, and I want you to underscore this word, must. The Son of God must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And I want, to, I want to spend a little bit of time here on the word must. It's just a small word that's easy to pass over, but it's very important. In fact, I was doing a little more study this morning just to reemphasize what this word is all about. Some translations of the Bible translate it should, that the Son of Man should suffer. One, one translation said that it would be inevitable that he would suffer many things, but I think that's missing the point. The original Greek word that's used there for must is the word day. If you transliterate that into English, it's D-E-I. In Greek, it's pronounced day. And that word literally means must. So why would we translate it any other way? It means must, or it means it is necessary. It is necessary. One way of looking at it this way, the word must here means Something that is necessary as to what is required so that something may be brought about. Did you catch that? Something that is necessary as to what is required so that something may be brought about. The word day, that little three-letter Greek word, means that. That Jesus, when he said, I, he must suffer, it means that this is required so that something may be brought about. So that what may be brought about? Our salvation. It was required. It wasn't optional. It reminds me of when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed for the cup to be passed from him. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And 
he, he had to do it. God wouldn't let him sidestep the cross because it was necessary for him to do it for us to be saved. It's kind of like if a teacher has to pass a certain exam to be a teacher or a doctor has to pass a certain exam to, to be a doctor or a lawyer has to pass the bar exam to be a lawyer. You wouldn't say, well, you should pass that. You would say, no, you must. You must pass it. And they were talking in Greek. They used the word day because it means it's that which is necessary to enable something else to be brought about. That's what that Greek word means when it says that Jesus must suffer. It didn't mean he had to, he was being forced to. It meant that he had to do it in order for something else, our salvation, to be brought about. That's why Jesus is the only way. Because there was a price that had to be paid for our salvation to be procured. And it was his death on the cross. This is the only valid Passport to heaven is signed in the blood of Jesus Christ, God's precious Son. And there is no other way that you can get there. Mankind was separated from God because of our sin. And the only sacrifice that could bring about salvation was Jesus. And that's why that verse says that he must suffer and be killed and after three days, rise again. So I want to ask you this morning, are you trusting in Jesus for your salvation? <clears throat> Maybe you've been looking into other religions. Maybe you've been thinking, well, one religion is as good as another. It really doesn't matter if I follow Christianity. All religions are pretty good. Or maybe you've been taking the, an eclectic view and, and taking one from this religion and one from that, but there is no other. Jesus is the only way. Or maybe you really haven't been looking into any particular religion. Maybe you've just been trying to make yourself good enough. You're kind of following the law and say, well, if I can just be a good person, maybe just keep the Ten Commandments. Maybe just better myself. God will be impressed and he'll take me to heaven. But it just won't work. Because we'll never be good enough. And the only way you can get to heaven is by trusting in Jesus, asking him into your life and to forgive you of your sins. So if you haven't done that yet, or maybe you did it a long time ago and you've gotten away from it and you know you're not right with God. Renew that relationship today and make sure you're right with Him. Because all of eternity hangs in the balance. You know, as I've thought about these three people that passed away on Friday, it's unusual, isn't it, to hear about three people in one day that you're connected with in one way or another. And you know, the thought goes through my head. You know, my uncle that I've told you, I never knew him to be in church. Never knew him to want to talk about anything spiritual. It just breaks your heart. And he's in eternity now. Now, I don't know if he got saved or not. But you know, a million years from now, he'll be wherever he is now. And if you rejected God for these 84 years, was it worth it? When you've got eternity out ahead of you. It's a long time. So make up your mind today. Don't take any chances. Let's stand together as we pray. Lord Jesus in heaven.